Hey, buckaroos and buckarettes, it's good to be back with you. This is another in a series of videos about mathematics. And today I want to talk about guitars and algebra. Now, you wouldn't think those two would have anything to do with each other, but they do. When I'm not doing this and when I'm not teaching my classes, I work on stringed instrument manufacture and design here at Purdue. I have written a couple of books on it. And along the way, I've learned how mathematics is used to describe music and more specifically how mathematics is used to describe musical instruments. So let's start with the guitar. I've got a uh, Fender uh, acoustic guitar here I bought a while back. It's an inexpensive guitar, but it's really pretty good for what it is. Um, I've hot rotted a little bit. I've made some modifications. You see that yellow stuff there? That's me. The red stuff there, that's also another modification. There's a few others to make it work a little better, make it sound a little better. But it's a pretty good guitar, and it's definitely uh, useful for what we're uh, going to do here today. Let's look at the location of these little wires that go across the neck. These are called frets, and when you press the, the string against a fret, it makes the string shorter and raises the pitch. So pressing against those frets is how you make notes on a guitar. Now, I, just an example. By the way, I'm having trouble today because I cut my finger. I was making a guitar yesterday and uh, stuck a carving knife through the end of my finger. Uh, I don't recommend it. Anyway, when I played those notes on the neck, those sounded right. If you're used to listening to music, those sounded like do, re, mi, fa, so it looks, sounds like I'm going up the scale. And I am. Well, stands to reason that those frets have to be in a pretty specific place, and they do. Well. How do you do that when you, when you go to build a guitar, more specifically when you go to design one? Well, let's start with the old way to do it from, you know, hundreds of years ago from the old country, and let's convert that to the, to the more modern description that we use. So, in the old days, there was the rule of 18. Somebody figured out that if you take a guitar, or pretty much any stringed instrument. There's a. Oh, you'd think I'd be better at that by now, but anyway. There's the nut. That's that red thing that was up at the end of the neck here. That's the nut, and that's called the saddle back here. Those are just the names of it. So there's the nut, and here's the saddle back here. Well, this distance right here, we'll just call that. L, since it needs a name. There. Okay. That's called the scale length. Well, somebody figured out that if I take that scale length and I divide it by 18, that's where I put that distance right there, is where I put the, the first fret. That distance is L over 18. When I want to know the, the, the next one, I divide the remaining distance by 18. When I want to go to the next one, I divide the remaining distance by 18 and keep working it that way. Well, that works, sort of. Turns out the right number isn't really 18. It's like 17.813 or something like that. This may have been empirical. Turns out one of the first people to write this down was Vincenzo Galilei, the father of Galileo Galilei. And there was a lot of drama and stuff around this. So this works sort of. The right number is 17.813. Well, how do we know that? Well, there's also a geometric interpretation of the rule of 18, and it looks like this. Draw a triangle, a very shallow triangle that looks like this, where that's L. That's the scale length. Right. This distance right there is L over 18. Okay, That's going to be the location of the first fret. Well, grab a, a compass and swing that down to here. Okay, there's the location of the first fret. Okay, so go up to here, swing down again. There's the location of the second fret. There's the location of the third fret, and so on. This is nice. 
You don't need to know any math to do this. You need to, you, well, you need to be able to do that. You need to divide L by 18 once, and then you're good to go. How precise is that? Well, not very. Depends on how good your compass is. Depends on how well you laid this out. Depends on a lot of things that don't have anything to do with mathematics. So you can do it this way if you just really have to. And people did this, or something akin to this, for a long time. But if you're going to have access to computer-controlled milling equipment where you routinely can work to dimensions of much less than a millimeter, this is not going to do. We need something better. So let's do that. Now, the way you lay frets out has something to do with what's called musical temperament. The original system laid out by Pythagoras millennia ago is nice, but in practice it doesn't work. And over the last many hundreds of years, there have been many different uh, ways of what's called tempering the Pythagorean scale to make it practical. The one we use in guitars is called equal temperament. Now, if you uh, play piano, you may know something about a, a, a collection of music called the Well-Tempered Clavier, K-L-A-V-I-E-R. What's that? Clavier is the German word for piano, and well-tempering is another one of these uh, temperament systems. It was written to show that well-tempering works. It, uh, research suggests that violinists tend to play in something called just tempering. So these are, these are three of the, of the many tempering systems that were out there. And the idea of equal tempering is that every note, okay, every time I go from one note to the next one up, the frequency increases by the same ratio every time. Okay? And so I can say that the frequency of a note is some ratio times the frequency of the fundamental, maybe the string that's open where I'm not pushing down at all. So this is the note at the first fret. There's the note of the open string. There's the note of the first fret. There's the ratio of the two. That means F2 is R times F1, and that's R squared times F0. And F3 is R times F2, and that's R cubed times F0. So you can see the pattern. And just to make sure we're all following along here, there's F0, F1, F2, F3, F4, and so on. When you get all the way up to F12, it's called an octave. The frequency at the 12th fret, the 12th note in this series, is twice the open string. Okay. That was defined by Pythagoras. Now it's called an octave because a scale only uses eight of those 12 notes. But when you get all the way down here, F12 is R, sorry, get that right, R to the 12th, F0. Okay. Well, it turns, let's go back up here. This is looking pretty algebraic, isn't it? Now let's do this. F12 over F0 is R to the 12th. Well, that's, that's just this. I just divided through by F0. Wow, that was a good noise. I just divide through by F0, and I get that. Well, that doesn't help me, except go back to our buddy Pythagoras, and we found out we know that equals 2. Now I'm getting somewhere. R is the twelfth root of two. Now I've been an engineer for a long time now, and that's probably the weirdest number I've ever used with any regularity. The twelfth root of two actually is something I need pretty much every day. And if you figure this out on your calculator, whatever, it's 1.059 something. I forgot what it is, but it's one, the first digits are 1.059. Okay. All right, so I used algebra to describe the, note, the ratios of successive notes, and using the idea of the octave, I applied it to that number to figure out that. Okay, well, where am I headed with this? How do you get from there to fret locations? Turns out, frequency of a, of a note 
is inversely proportional to the length of the string. So the shorter the string is, the higher the note is. That means I can now write down an algebraic expression for the length of the string. Now there are other videos in, uh, on my channel here describing in more detail how to do that. So let me just cut to the end here and erase this stuff. And I'm going to write it out this way. This expression right here tells me the location of all the frets. There's the scale length. There's that number R we just figured out. In N, and there and there, that's the fret number. Okay? So the distance from the nut to fret 1 is when R equals 1. When R equals 2, that's the distance from the nut to there. Now, by the way, why am I going measuring from here, not from here? Well, for reasons that don't really matter here, we actually move this a little bit. The, the location of this isn't known beforehand. The location of this is, so we use this as our reference. That's why that 1 minus is there. All right. So, if I put the frets in the right location, the guitar sounds right. So let's think about what we got here. This one algebraic expression works on every musical instrument that uses equal temperament. Well, this is amazing. All I need to know is a scale length, and I can lay the frets out on anything. I don't need tables. I don't need triangles and compasses and stuff. I can just figure this out using a spreadsheet or something, and I can use this one expression for every fretted instrument I'll probably ever build. All I need to know is the scale length. Now, just for context, the scale length on this one is 25 and a half inches. It's in inches because it was designed in the U.S. Um, that's 647.7 millimeters. The shortest instrument that you routinely see that has frets on it is a mandolin, and mandolins typically have scale lengths of around 13 and a half inches. Sorry, I don't know what that is in millimeters because I live in the U.S. Um, ukuleles, also very short. On the other end of the scale are electric bases, fretted bases. Um, those have a scale length of 34 inches for a, a long scale base. That's pretty much the spectrum. But if I decided to make one longer for whatever reason, this equation still works. So there you go, folks. Guitars and algebra. They're related. I hope this helps, and we'll talk to you next time.